Morning everyone, welcome back to the shed. So Friday, nearly the weekend, um, gives us a bit of time just to wrap up some of the things that have happened this week. Most of this week's videos have been to do with the Su-17 fitter that I've been building, which is still kind of on the go. But I thought today I'd take a look at something else just very quickly and give you an indication of something that I'll be building over the over the next month or so once the fitter is out of the way. And that thing is this. This is Italeri's brand new F35A Lightning 2. This thing's just uh, just arrived. So I thought I'd take a take a quick look at it, show you what's in the box and what you can expect should you decide to, to have a go at one of one of these things. Firstly, it's a very big box and it's crammed full of parts as well. There's there's an awful lot in this. So it's probably going to take up some space on your workbench, I would think. Uh, but you can see that it is kind of crammed full of, of bits and pieces. The main sections on the top of the box, followed by all of the smaller details underneath. Now, it's an area of taking the time to replicate the CTOL version of this aircraft. So they've replicated the F-35A. That's kind of like a stock standard version that will be used for air forces around the world. In so doing, they've included markings in this kit for five different air forces, American, Australian, Dutch, Italian and Israeli. All of those aircraft obviously share common colour schemes, they've got low vis markings and they share essentially the same weapon loads and, um, and kind of specifications sort of thing. So that's what Italeri have decided to do. For British modellers, obviously we would have liked them to have replicated the B version, the, the, the kind of Stovall version of that, um, but that hasn't happened, so you get that kind of more stripped down, down kind of look to this kit. Given that Italeri have had to use an aircraft, or replicate an aircraft rather, that is still very much on the secret list in terms of internal fixtures and fittings, its, its kind of specification in terms of its role, or the pilot's thing, all of that kind of thing, they've replicated this aircraft, I think, really well in this scale. Following on from their F-104 that they released uh, last year, year before possibly, I wasn't particularly impressed by how they'd gone about dealing with surface detail and that kind of thing. And although the model was impressive, and I've seen built-up versions of it looking really nice, I wasn't particularly kind of pleased by certain aspects of the kit. This thing looks slightly different. I think that's that's forced in a way by the way that the real aircraft is manufactured. Anybody that's seen one of these things in the flesh will know how smooth it is. It kind of looks like a block of amethyst. It's it's just smooth flowing lines all the way uh, across the surface of the aircraft. And although I know a lot of people don't really like the shape and they think it's ugly and everything, I don't actually. I think it's really impressive looking. There's no getting away from the quality of the manufacture of the shape of the aircraft. When you see it in the air and you see it then sat on the ground, it's an incredible piece of technology and it's an incredible look. If a Harrier was an E-type Jaguar, then the F-35 is a Ferrari LaFerrari. It's that different in, in kind of look and feel and the way that the whole thing has kind of been manufactured. So it's an area of gone quite some way to replicate in that look in miniature um, in 30 seconds ago. So digging through the box, there are um, a, a number of things that obviously kind of stand out. The first thing is the way that they've replicated much of the airframe. You can see here there are two bags. This is the upper section and this is the lower section. The lower section it obviously includes cutouts for the nose gear bay, the boarding ladder, intakes, um, weapons bays and undercarriage bays. So you have these cutouts. That The kit then allows you to have these sections open or closed. 
there's an awful lot of detail that goes into that. So the main bulk of the construction, in much the same way as an F22, is in this lower part of the fuselage. This is where everything kind of goes. You build the cockpit into this kind of section, you build the weapons base into, into this area, add the depiction of the Pratt & Whitney F135 engine that is included in the kit, that goes into this section. And then on top of that, you fix the, the upper panel on that encloses everything in and then wings get attached, tailplanes get attached, fins, that kind of thing. Having looked at this um, closely, I think this is a really impressive moulding. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of finesse about this and I think the shape has been kind of well captured by Italeri. I haven't compared it completely to the photographs I took of the real aircraft in at Fairford um, last year, but certainly from looking at this and having a cursory look at, at what I'd what I'd seen of my images and also images online, it looks to have captured the shape well. One of the things that, that kind of does stand out, both metaphorically and literally, are the coatings, the RAM coatings that that form shapes around the main access panels on the surface of this aircraft. It's an area followed what other manufacturers have done and they've raised these panels up uh, away from the surface. It's not a huge kind of change in surface height between the main airframe and these panels but it's definitely there and you can feel it underneath your finger you can see that they're raised. On the real aircraft there's no such raised panels. The, the, those RAM areas around both the access panels that are opened regularly, such as the, 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 the steps on the side, weapons bays, undercarriage bays, that kind of thing, and also panels around the aircraft that are only open for maintenance once a year, are, are covered with a, a layer of, of this coating and it's smooth. When you look at the aircraft, when you look at it uh, um, and you see light bouncing off the surface of it, there is no shift in height it is just a smooth flow. The only thing that, that changes is the colour between the, the darker grey of the overall camouflage and the paler grey of these ram panels. And even that changes depending on light and depending on the kind of the, the, the way the aircraft is positioned in your eye line and the way that the sun bounces off that. So I can understand why Italeri have gone down that route and I can understand why they've raised those panels up. It makes painting them easier, I can, I can see that, but it's not wholly realistic to my eye and it's certainly not wholly realistic to me in this scale. I think Hasegawa in their kit might have offered those, in their 72nd scale kit, may have offered those panels as decal and I think that's a better option. Although in a kit this size that would add a that would add another huge decal sheet to this because there's an awful lot of them. Now, along with the moulded panels that, that are supplied by Italeri in this kit, they also offer a sheet of masks and a, a small instruction sheet, this one here. This um, guides you through the process of masking off the panels that you've already painted in a lighter colour before painting the darker um, the darker, what they describe as medium grey camouflage. Now that's a compromise of sorts. Although Italeri provide much of what's needed in terms of the larger sections, there's a huge amount that isn't included on, on this masking sheet and I can again understand that because there would be a huge sheet to use on this model. They offer on their masking sheets, for instance, these kind of um, panels that run across the surface of the upper fuselage, one there and one there, but ignore the other ones, they ignore the panels around that. So for you to create a model that is truly the way that the real thing looks, there's going to be no getting away from the idea that this is going to include a huge amount of masking. And although you could perhaps fudge that a little bit in smaller scales, in a big model like this, or rather on a big model like this, that surface shift between the medium grey and the lighter grey is going to need to be there for this model to look realistic. It, it's it will then be up to the model maker to decide whether or not he wants to have have 
quite a distinct shift between those colours or whether he wants to uh, he or she wants to have um, a more subtle shift between between those those kind of tones the other thing as well is that that perhaps needs to be borne in mind is that the that the kind of have glass coating that's that forms part of the finish on this aircraft means that the darker grey may well need, if that's the route you want to go down and you want to try and replicate the way it looks in reality, is going to have to have some kind of metallic finish on it, whereas the paler grey is going to be a flat colour. And there is, and then when you add on to that process the idea that that, that that metallic finish is slightly shinier than the pale grey, you can see why this is going to be a really interesting model to paint. I painted an F-22 several years ago now and spent the thick end of eight months trying to work out how I was going to replicate that, that finish on, on the model and how I was going to try and duplicate the way that it looked. I'm not entirely sure it was completely successful but it was a, it was kind of a poor way to do. So I'm not sure how it's going to work in this. And given that I'm the one that's going to be building this thing, um, I think that's going to take some kind of head scratching to try and work out how that's going to, how that's going to look. Along with the, 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 the larger sections on this model, the, the kit also includes um, runners that include all of the, all of the smaller um, bits and pieces. These two here, um, this one, this runner includes all the weapons bays, bay doors, cockpit and ancillary parts for undercarriage bays, that kind of thing. Surface detail within the bays is pretty good. It's not as comprehensive as it is in the real thing. The real thing is is an absolute mass of pipes and, and, and structural members and actuators and that kind of thing. So if you wanted to add extra detail into those weapons bays and then have them on show, maybe put the model on a mirror, um, there's plenty of scope in there. They're big parts as well. You can see how big these sections are. So there's, there's plenty of scope within that for you to go completely bonkers. I noticed when I looked at this as well that there are, there are issues within these bays. There are ejector pin um, circles that can be seen as depressions in and around some of the detail that may be, that may be difficult to, to deal with. Some of them you might be able to get rid of, um, others will be kind of almost impossible. It'll be interesting to see how the, the inclusion of weapons within those bays disguises some of those issues. They, they also appear on some, the inside of some of the doors as well. So I see some filling in my, in my future. Um, but they only seem to, to, to appear on these kind of curved sections. I noticed that on, on flatter sections here, these are what I, this is what I assume is the nose gear um, bay walls that have been split down, flat packed. There, there don't appear to be any on those, and there certainly don't appear to be any in the cockpit, but the weapons bays are they're kind of plagued by them a little bit. This runner here, this includes the um, depiction of the, um, the F-135 engine that powers the, the, the F-35 family. It's kind of neat and tidy without blowing your socks off too much. It's hidden in the model anyway. Once, once it's kind of in there, I guess you could perhaps slide it out. Uh, I notice there's a bulkhead here that has got a hole in so you may be able to, to, to deal with that. I don't know. Full intake ramps are included. These here flow from the main intakes and they connect up to the engine so there is a, f a complete section there. So once those once those ramps are painted you will be able to look down them and see the, the face of the turbine. That's kind of a nice a nice kind of feel about that. The other, other parts in here obviously include main wing sections. These, this runner here includes includes wings. Separate control surfaces are are included as standard as part of this kit. So that allows uh, allows a certain amount of, of of animation on the model. Pictures I've seen of, of the aircraft, the ones I took, tended to have those kind of tucked up. But I think there are probably photographs out there that, that will show them slightly deflected. I don't think there's too much of an issue with that. Again, ram panels that appear on the main fuselage sections appear on the wings as well. Um, and that will help you to, to delineate those lighter grey sections when you come to paint the model. Again, this this is another runner. This one just includes, um, I guess they're called tailor-ons, um, and also 
uh, multi-part um, US 16E ejector seat that's that's in here. That's this this part here plus undercarriage pieces. The model is completed with um, a selection of stores. Many of the photographs of F-35s show them clean. They have them in that kind of stealthy mode, so all the weapons are tucked up into the un into the weapons bay underneath the, the, the fuselage. However, photographs are now starting to appear of F-35s in configurations that are likely to be seen once the aircraft enters service, and that's with, with the six um, pylons, three under each wing, that carry missiles and bombs, and will carry those once the kind of initial round of, of stealthy missions is, is over. They'll then bolt these things on and they'll be used. The kit includes um, a reasonable selection of weapons, but nothing that's that's kind of too over overblown. Um, looking at the the runners, that includes AMRAMs, AIM nine X um, missiles, plus JDAMs doesn't include anything else. There are photographs out there now of, um, of F-35s carrying GBUs underneath the wings. But it's enough to keep you going. The configurations offered in the kit also allow you to put AMRAMs and JDAMs or JDAMs inside the, the under fuselage weapons bays. Um, the instructions take you through all of that. Um, so in here yeah, as I thought, you can have, you, there are three configurations in here, they just list them as A, B and C, uh, understandably. Um, one is with AIM-9X missiles under the outer wing pylons and JDAMs and AMRAMs inside the weapons bays on each side. Other ones are the 9X and then JDAMs on one of the wing pylons and just AMRAMs and the, and the other one is that configuration but with JDAMs moved around. It's you know, it's kind of, it's just there what it is. Um, there are plenty of 30 second scale kits out there that have got plenty of additional weapons that could bolt onto this. I'm thinking of adding um, GBU-12s underneath the wings of, of this thing to, to, to sh sort of shift the way it looks very slightly. I think that'll be an interesting, an interesting thing. It's, um, along with the, uh, the, the sort of standard kit instructions, these ones are drawn out and I mention that because I noticed that the instructions in their flying banana that's just arrived, those instructions are like a photographic format. So they're not they're not drawings like this. They're they're kind of photographs that guide you through it, which I thought was a bit odd. But you know they're kind of okay. Along with that, uh, uh, with the with the main instructions, there are painting instructions in here as well. These are these are now as standard in Italy kits, actually as standard in most kits now, in being full colour and they guide you through everything that you need um, for for the versions offered in the kit. Um, there are two American versions in this, uh, one from Eglin Air Force Base, the other from Nellis, and then the other aircraft are one from William Town Air Base, that's an Australian one, Israeli Air Force one, and one for the uh, Royal uh, Netherlands Air Force. All of, the, all of the markings are found on one single decal sheet and they're all well printed. This is a cartograph decal sheet as you would probably imagine now. So you've got lots of pale grey markings and a few bright flashes. Decal sheet also includes um, a a decal that goes under glass into the cockpit that shows the display. Uh, I had a look at a photograph of the F-35 cockpit and it seems to be very stripped out on a real aircraft and all you've got is a massive multifunction display in front of the pilot and no head-up display. All of those, all of that information that would normally be on a head-up display is actually inside his helmet. So it's a very stripped out look in there. So when you look at the kit and you see how much detail that Italy have have included, there, um, you may well be surprised to see that there's, there's kind of little in there but in the real aircraft there's kind of little in there so don't be don't be sort of pushing that 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 idea of of of, of detail being missing too far because that's that's kind of how it looks so overall uh, I'm kind of impressed by the way that this kit looks it it offers the potential for a large and imposing model of this aircraft 
I know that the, the F-35 program splits opinion like politics splits opinion. Um, but I rather like the way that it looks and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of um, impressed so far by what I've read about it. Having seen one of these things at, at Fairford last year, in fact seen two of these things at Fairford last year in the air, I was extremely impressed by its performance and I don't think I'll forget in a hurry seeing the the VTOL version of, of the aircraft coming to a stop in front of the crowd line and then sitting there like it was on a sheet of glass. I've never seen anything more rock solid in the air. It was an astonishing sight. And I just completely fell in love with the way that this thing looked. So I couldn't help but, but go and spend some time around the, the, the aircraft that were down, kind of in the static park, guarded away from, from us. And it gave me the opportunity to take a lot of photographs of this thing. It looked gorgeous on the ground and I couldn't wait to build a model. So now that this is here, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to, to seeing how this looks as a, as a built-up piece. It's an area to be commended for having a go at this as, as a new addition to their 30 second scale range. It's, it's not perfect for reasons that I've, I've mentioned in terms of those, those surface features and some of, of, of what I've seen in this initial look at the, the, the moulding of certain areas. But in terms of detail, in terms of the way that it looks in the box and how it feels when you're, when you're looking at the parts, I can't help but be impressed by this. So, um, so thanks to, um, to the hobby company for, for sending this over. And let me have a look at it. Before I go, another kit has just turned up. So I thought you might um, like to take a, a quick look at this. Cardboard box. And that is this. This is um, Ravel's brand new Spitfire Mark 9C. This has literally just arrived about half an hour ago. Um, so it's the first time I've had a, had a kind of look, even seen the box. So I thought I'd quickly show you this. I haven't looked at the parts or anything like that. So I'm just going to quickly open it so that you can see what's included. So what we've got are three bags of parts. Obviously these cover main airframe sections, this one here, that's fuselage, wings, this is smaller details, full cockpit, uh, choice of exhaust, choice of rudders, control surfaces, detailed cockpit, that kind of thing. And then a couple of little bags here of um, weapons and uh, wheels, superficial details, that, that sort of thing. Having a quick look at it now, surface detail on this looks really nice, it's nicely kind of engraved, there's rivet detail on it. I know there have been conversations about original releases within this family of, of Spitfire kits from Revell, they've talked about those kind of rivets being a little heavy, I think they look fine. So it looks like it could build up into, into quite a nice model I think. I've certainly seen them built up and they, they do look great. This one also includes a full set of instructions in Revell's now familiar coloured pictorial style and a choice of two different aircraft, one of which is a Royal Canadian Air Force Mark 9C from 416 Squadron and the second one is a Mark 9C from 601 Squadron based at uh, Farno in Italy. The Royal Air Force one's rather nice, it's in what looks like sprayed aluminium. I think this version might have been offered in Edward's 72nd scale kit, I'm not sure. It certainly looks like the one that's in that's in their, their smaller kit. I like that, that colour scheme, it's, it's rather nice. So it looks to be a competent kit for, from Revell and the fact that it's kind of brand new and, and sort of hot off the presses, makes it all, all, the, all the more exciting. So we will look at this in, in more detail at some point over the, the coming months, coming months, over the next coming weeks, I guess. So this is, this is how it looks today, just having opened the, the cardboard box. So thanks 
to Ravel for, for, for sending this in so promptly. I spoke to them earlier on this week and to have had it this, this, this morning ready for this little roundup is, is just brilliant. So thank you very much. Okay, so let's stick this away. So there we are, this week's roundup, all done and dusted. We've got a chance to see the the Italeri 32nd scale F35 Lightning II. Also, uh, a look at Ravel's new Spitfire Mark 9C. I'm sorry it was as kind of abridged as it was. It really has just arrived, so I've not taken a, taken too much of a look at at, uh, at that. But hopefully, within the, the coming days, I, I, I will do. This is likely to be uh, the last video for a week. I'm off to the States next week, so I'm not sure that I'm going to have time to do too much before I go. Hopefully I'll be able to do some filming while I'm away at the show and also perhaps take some footage at Pensacola um, uh, Naval Air Museum as well, which I'm hoping to visit while I'm over there. So I will get back on track when I get back but I think it's unlikely that I'm going to find some time to do to do anything on Monday and Tuesday of next week so um, so in the meantime being Friday I'd really like to wish you all a, a, a fantastic weekend I'd like to wish Coventry City all the very best as well for the cup final on Sunday at Wembley I'll be going to the game rather than going to my local club show at Cosford much to the consternation of my uh, of my my friends who are all going to be gathering there and wondering why I've picked football over over uh, over a model show. Well, that's kind of just the the way it fell this year, unfortunately, having watched the team play all season and uh, got a chance to go and watch them in the final. It seemed like a chance of a lifetime or a, or a model show. And as much as I really wanted to go to Cosford and, and, and I love the event, I just couldn't pass up the opportunity. So I'd, li I'd also like to wish the, the organisers of the show all the very best and I hope everything goes well. I'm sure it will. Um, I'm sure it's going to be a, a fantastic day for everybody. So thanks very much for looking in. Thanks for, for checking out this uh, this channel um, again. And for those people who are regularly watching the nonsense that I come out with, really appreciate it, really appreciate the support. And I hope to see you all again very soon. From me and from The Shed, have a great weekend and I'll see you again very soon. Cheers, bye.